Hello and welcome to another edition of Currently in Quincy. I'm Joe Catalano, and on today's program, we'll chat with Renee Duchesne Farkas of the Woodward School for Girls here in Quincy about a new community speaker series that they are starting up beginning this week. First, though, we check out the weather and the news for you. Currently in Quincy, brilliant sunshine, but it's brisk, 51 degrees. Not going to get much warmer than that today. A chilly night tonight, dropping down into the mid 30s, and then the cool Cool down begins tomorrow. Sun and clouds, highs barely 50 degrees. Look at tomorrow night dropping off into the upper 20s. Another bright but brisk day on Wednesday. This will be the coldest, I think, of the week. Wednesday's highs only in the mid 30s. We're talking low 20s Wednesday night. Warm up starts on Thursday. Sun and clouds into the low 40s, and it should get warmer from there on out. But again, sunny and 51 in Quincy right now. In the news today, the Quincy Health Department is urging anybody who was at the Gold Post Bar and Grill on Water Street from noon to 10 p.m. on November the 9th for more than 15 minutes to contact them due to a possible case of COVID-19. Call 617-376-1273. Other news, the man that's serving a life sentence for the death of two-year-old Bella Bond five years ago will have an appeal hearing this week. Michael McCarthy argues that he never hurt the girl and that prosecutors have no evidence that he was involved in her killing. Bella's body was found in a trash bag on Deer Island in June of 2015. She was eventually identified from a tip to police her mother, Rochelle Bond, accepted a plea deal to testify against McCarthy in exchange for less than three years in prison and probation. A Bond testified that McCarthy punched the girl in the stomach. However, an exact cause of death has never been determined. Quincy officials are considering a new way to purchase electricity. Under the proposal, the city would buy all of the power that Quincy needs in bulk from National Grid in an effort to lower and stabilize rates and protect customers. Now, that plan would provide customers a choice of how much of their electricity that they'd like to come from renewable sources. Quincy City Council President Nina Liang says that there will be a public hearing about the proposal on December 7th. From what I know and from um, what I've learned about it over the last year, you know, I, I think there's great benefit to it, right? The more choices that you have, the better. It creates more competition, you know, so you're not, you know, monopolized by one singular company and the prices that they're giving you. Um, so now as residents, you know, we have options, right? There's more competitive pricing models that can be created by this. Um, and at the end of the day, it's better for the environment, right? It's renewable energy. And so uh, for those two reasons, I think it's a win, but I'm really interested to see uh, what else we might learn out of the public hearing coming up on December 7th. And hopefully folks will be able to tune in to that as well. Now, under the plan, there would be no change to the way customers pay their bills. Customers could opt out of the program at any time with no penalty. As the holidays approach, Quincy Mayor Thomas Koch is issuing a reminder about the state's new coronavirus restrictions. Governor Baker has reduced the recommended number of people at indoor events to 10 and for outside events to 25. The mayor says the main goal of the new restrictions is to discourage large indoor parties or gatherings where the spread of the virus is most problematic. They're also suggesting no more than 10 people indoors and 25 people outdoors. And what does that mean? Uh, I know um, some of the folks that may be churchgoers or temple goers, you can still go to the temple, you still go to church. When you have a facility that holds that number of people, you're okay. I think it's more of a message for those people. If you're having a party at home, uh, parties somewhere, maybe in a small hall, uh, that's where the problems seem to emanate from. So it's a restriction on that. That's what we're looking to cut down on. So. Uh, outdoor gatherings, of course, this time of year is less and less outdoor gatherings uh, because of the time of year we're going into. Earlier last month, the mayor announced the cancellation of the annual Christmas parade, Santa parachute jump, and Quincy Center lighting ceremony. However, he said Christmas lights will still be installed in Quincy Center, Wollaston, and North Quincy. Well, 10 formerly homeless veterans have a new place to stay in Randolph. 
by the Bills and Mainspring of Quincy and Brockton in partnership with Envision Bank, recently dedicated the new home on Moulton Street next to the Envision Bank branch in Randolph Center. By the Bills and Mainspring President John Yaswinski expressed his gratitude for the partnership that led to the new facility. And Governor Baker also virtually sent a congratulations. Uh, this is a great example of you know, many people coming together on behalf of a big idea and pulling it off and making it happen. And, and the fact that it was only a year ago uh, the ground was broken on this project speaks to the fact that you were determined to get it done and managed to find a way to continue to move forward despite 10 months of a pandemic in the middle. And I think in many respects uh, that kind of commitment that kind of follow through, that kind of creativity and imagination, it's exactly the same thing that so many of the veterans who will have an opportunity uh, to sleep in a warm bed will benefit from uh, would understand. Because in many respects, everybody knows in the military, it's just get it done. And all of you, you just got it done. And on behalf of the Commonwealth and on behalf of the veterans of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I just wanna say thank you for getting it done. Now, Envision Bank sold the land to Father Bills for $1 and donated $500,000 toward construction and financed $300,000 for the project. Additional funding for that $2.5 million project was secured through the state and the town of Randolph. The home will provide on-site case management and support services to help the tenants gain life and job skills. And two of the apartments are designed for disabled residents. Coming up, we will chat with the head of the Woodward School for Girls here in Quincy, Renee Duchenne Farkas, about how they're helping the community during the pandemic. That's next. I would definitely consider it to be a sign of strength to be able to reach out and get the help that you need. Substance Use Helpline, Kathy speaking. May I help you? That was a rough journey. You know, Chief Tom, I sure could use something to eat. Turkey sounds pretty good. But you know, poultry products like turkey and chicken are primary sources of the bacteria Salmonella and Campylobacter. These organisms can cause foodborne illnesses. Symptoms such as stomach cramps, vomiting, diarrhea, and fever can occur one to five days after eating foods with high levels of bacteria. The Department of Public Health recommends that you protect yourself, your family, and your friends by following these safe turkey tips. First, don't cross-contaminate. When you shop, keep the turkey away from other foods in your shopping cart. Place the turkey below other foods in your refrigerator in order to prevent contamination from turkey juices. It is best to thaw the turkey in the refrigerator, not at room temperature. Use separate cutting boards for cooked foods and raw foods. Never put the cooked turkey on the unwashed plate that previously held uncooked turkey. Clean your hands and food surfaces often. Wash your hands with hot soapy water before and after you touch the turkey. And after you use the bathroom, change diapers and play with pets. Wash all cutting boards, dishes, kitchen tools and countertops with hot soapy water after you finish fixing the turkey. Cook foods to safe temperatures. Cook the turkey thoroughly. Use a food thermometer to check for doneness. Cook the whole turkey unstuffed to 165 degrees Fahrenheit. And chill foods promptly. Put prepared foods and leftover turkey in the refrigerator within two hours. Well, it doesn't look like you had much luck getting a turkey, Chief Tom. I'll settle for some corn on the cob. Pleased to be checking back in with the head of school at the Woodward School for Girls, Renee Duchenne Farkas, for a little update on how things are going uh, during this challenging time. Renee, nice to see you again. Right. You too, Joe. Thank you for inviting me.
Oh, it's our pleasure. We're really happy to get a little uh, inside information about how Woodward is uh, coping during these times. Are the girls back in the classroom? Yeah, so we've been back since September. It's a little bit amazing every day to think it's almost the end of November, which means we've been here for three months. Um, as you know, we were off location last year by a big renovation project that was happening and it couldn't have been more beneficial. Little did we know then that coming back in after COVID that we were coming into a whole new ventilation system. You know, there's been all these talks about the HVAC systems and the open windows. So um, it all worked incredibly well to us. So we're in a brand new building. Um, the girls are in now Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. And we're just going remote. We stay remote on Wednesday. And it's more just to keep our foot in being remote um, because, you know, we do anticipate something to happen. The holidays are right after that with more virus. You know, we all see the virus uptick right now. And, you know, we're monitoring every single day. But we are able to continue what we call the four W's, which is always wear a mask, wash your hands frequently. And we've got stations throughout the building. Um, watch your distance and watch your social size. Um, and I think that Woodward is probably super advantaged because of what I now call the small school advantage that um, my colleagues in bigger schools, particularly the bigger public schools have, you know, 25 students in a classroom. I have eight, so I don't have to cohort in different days and all of that. So we've got a, a pretty normal thing going on. And um the happiness to see the girls engaged in their learning and happy and chatting all through masks. I think they don't even think there's a mask on their face. Yeah. I have my office door closed now and my back door window open so I could take my mask off just to work with you. But yeah. uh, we are covered all day long. Yeah, some of the healthcare professionals have said um, that, you know, adults are having a much harder time with mask wearing than children are. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you can't hear the other person. It's muffled and the kids don't even doesn't even phase them so and, yeah they're very that's adaptable right. Yeah. that's right great. right exactly yeah so social distancing in the classroom obviously has not been a factor with such a small student body right yeah and we moved all to single desks for this time being we put the double desks upstairs in storage and so everybody's six to eight feet apart minimum and it works because you know we are the smaller class size and we're able to cohort the students together so they actually have an active meeting space and that's for the middle school is in the auditorium. And then we have the upper school, only grades nine to 11 in the new student center, which they love. And then the seniors have the library. So the seniors think they have their own room, but they're so busy with college applications and all, we wanted to just give them a spot to be and keep their things because we can't really use lockers or anything yet. Oh, well, sure, yeah. Um, but, but we're functioning that it's, it's pretty beautiful. It's pretty beautiful. That's yeah. Pretty, and has really there been, happy. you know, any cases, I have to ask, because there have been in the public schools. Right. No, we haven't. We've had one or two close contacts. And for the first one, we pivoted right to, to remote learning just to assure everybody that we knew what we were doing and that we would be overly cautious. That's a, our term now. And then the second one, we didn't have to pivot because of the, you know, every circumstance is different. And, um, we were able to wait it out the five days. We stayed in class. The student hadn't been in class. And I must say, if there's an opportunity to just say something about the Quincy Department of Public Health, Ruth jo Jones, the commissioner, has been unbelievable. I mean, because in the beginning, we would call about every little thing, you know, uh, just, just to say, should I do this? What should I do about that? And she's just been terrific. She's been on a couple of um, family Zooms with the school community and faculty Zoom meetings, we call them Zooms now, right? Meetings, right. Um, where she could help them really understand what is our protocol and she helped us write our protocol for re-entry. So we're in, a, we're in a pretty lucky place, but you know, every day is, you gotta be ready, right? And, and we do temperature checks every morning still. Okay. We have felt that that's been a good safety guide for us. Mm -hmm. And we've had one or two temperatures sent them home and they've ended up having a cold or something with their pediatrician. Uh, and one with an earache, and it's just like, you know, but everything has to be in abundance of caution. Right? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, and in fact, uh, Woodward is already making uh, kind of post-pandemic plans, right? Yes, yes. So, you know, I'll talk about the speaker series. You want me yeah. to do that for a few minutes? Sure. So we, uh, there was always this vision when the school, 
building was under renovation of what's the next Woodward to be? What's the great Woodward? Because, you know, we knew we were going to come into a beautiful building. We're 125 years old. I'm a new head of school and I want to like get the word of Woodward out and want to say, well, what, what else can Woodward do? So we've got probably seven strategies, but this one was called, um, raising awareness to Woodward because in all my interviews and people I still talk with, hardly anybody knows about Woodward unless you had a friend who went there. It's kind of the best kept secret and I don't want that to be the best kept secret, right? And particularly now. And so I always had this vision to do a speaker series, a community speaker series on important topics that would be related to our mission, which would be girls' education. Um, and that I wanted it to be a resource to people who aren't necessarily even part of Woodward because there's lots of families who have young girls and young girls can sometimes be complicated students growing up. And I wanted to um, be a resource again to the community for people and my own parents as well to bring on important topics and bring in speakers to talk about these topics with people and, you know, help educate. So really being an educational and a community resource. So the pandemic, you know, the, the problem, that the pandemic set for me with the speaker series is that I can't have them in this beautiful auditorium in this gorgeous um, theater, you know, where I would like that and have 250 people seating. I have to do them over Zoom, but that's okay. We're still going to move forward with it and, and build it. So this year we're focusing on girls in education and their parents and primarily about, you know, coping with the pandemic era that we're in because it's a different time now than it was in March and April when we were, we just didn't know what was happening, right? Now it's, it, we're living it. And so now wanting to bring important topics, have conversations with people about, you know, what they're feeling, what they're seeing in their own family, what else can they do to make this even better? So we chose to focus on the learning gap because there's so many different models out there of what the students are doing. I don't think there's a lot of models where they're coming to school four days a week, kind of like it's normal. And that many of the students are remote two days and in three days or vice versa. And, you know, what, what has all this um, isolation or distancing done for, for children? Because we're starting to now talk about that because it's been long enough. And we know that schools, the educational component of a school is so relational. You know, if I have a great teacher, I'm going to do better on that subject than if I have one where I have to do a lot of it on my own, right? So we wanted to open that, those kind of conversations up now with, with um, parents and help them because I think the big piece that, that, I want to, that I think about all the time, COVID or not COVID, is that the, the learning is multifaceted it's not just the academics, it's the social and it's the emotional, and it's also the physical being, you know, of students. And when we see students every day, we can notice if there's a mood down or, or something's going on, and you want to look at that whole child all the time in order to, you know, educate them, but also to grow and develop them, right? And that I think that what the research is starting to say is that we're starting to see some impacts of all of this what they're calling isolation. I don't really like that word. It's such a drastic word. Mm -hmm. But even if students are coming to school two days a week, they're not getting that social interaction that they feed off of, right? And I think Lynn Griffin, who's a um, gonna be our first keynote speaker, she runs a company called Proactive Parenting on the South Shore of a Situate. And she's got a you know uh, nursing medical background, education background, does a lot of work in mental health. Um, and she's going to talk about it in a positive way, not in a, a big negative way, but just what, what signs to look for, what can we do, what are parents feeling. Um, oh, so here's our ad. That's right. Okay, so close the learning gap and um, helping address the impact of, of what's happening because I think that we're also now seeing, I don't think, I know, we're also seeing parents, particularly moms, becoming very fatigued over this because they've got their, you know, back in March, you had to share your house with every member. They had to have their own workstation, right? Well, that's all kind of, we know how to do that now. But that constant need for keeping my child focused, how can I help my child do well? What about the kids who hate being on remote? Because there are students who hate that. 
So we want, we want to open those conversations and be a place where parents can come in and talk about it. And I think what Lynn will do is make them all leave feeling better about themselves and feeling more confident as parents. Um, she's talked at Woodward a few times and the parents said, oh, she's amazing. I, I, I was able to like just get more comfortable with all of this. And, you know, so even if that's it, that's a good thing, right? That's a good thing. So, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is going to be open, I think, to everyone. Is that right? Absolutely. And the speaker series, pandemic or not, will always be open to everybody. Um, again, it, I want it positioned as Woodward is a resource in the community particularly for girls in education, social and emotional development. But I think a lot of parents with boys will relate to the same thing, right? And, and get something out of it. And, you know, the education systems weren't built to deal with this kind of extended shutdown. And so there's impacts for everybody, for the parent, for the student. Um, and I try to keep that eye open even at Woodward, even though we're lucky to be back. You know, we don't know what's going on in students' homes with all these people home and remote and mom and dad don't go off to work anymore. Or mom, I think we now starting to see statistics that more women are coming out of the workforce because they can't balance this, right? Um, yeah, there's yeah, a so, the globe, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you saw uh, today actually talking about the impact uh, specifically on young adults. So some, uh, mm -hmm. some studies and don't forget the studies are only as old as the pandemic, pandemic exactly has been right. there's not a lot of data, um, exactly initial right. studies yeah. that are showing yep. folks 18 to 24 years old are experiencing bouts of uh, depression, uh, isolation, yes. as you mentioned, uh, sleep uh, disruption, you know, things of that nature. And they, they connected to this, to the pandemic. Look what's happening with these college kids, right? I mean, my graduating class of last year, you know, they were traumatized all spring and they did go back. Some of them are remote. I'm hoping to see them next week on a Zoom meeting. I'm setting it up to just say, what's happening? What are you doing? What's it like? Because, you know, we saw in September when some of the colleges started opening, students were in their room for two weeks by themselves and somebody was passing them a meal. I mean, it's almost like being in jail, right? Right, exactly. I mean, it's really sad. It's really sad. Yeah, I really worry about it. Um, and I, I think that we're going to see more and more of this. So, you know, as any issue happens, the more you talk about it, the better you'll deal with it and the better the outcome will be. And that's what we want to do is generate the conversations, you know, bring in some speakers. I've been talking to a couple of colleges, Smith College and Simmons, um, and they're interested to help us brainstorm um, topics to discuss mm -hmm. and also people to come in and talk about them. Oh, so I'm excited yeah. about that. Yeah. yeah. How often do you envision holding these, uh, these series, Renee? Uh, I'm smiling because we have a lot of these going on now. We we started a new series, which is really just to our students, where we have alumni coming in uh, monthly and talking to the girls about their life at Woodward, their life afterward, and what their career is now. Um, I'm also beginning a legendary alumni speaker series, which will only be two or three times, but we have some very famous alumni from Woodward that I didn't know and I've discovered them in the last two years. Oh, do and, tell uh, me. Drop some names if you could. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Marilyn Johnson. Yeah. And she was, you know, special agent to Jimmy Carter and uh, she's 98. I visited with her twice and she's up in New Hampshire. She could walk faster down the street than me. <laughs> That's and, great. Um, and she's going to come on and I have the girls interviewing her and, you know, she was born in 1922. So she's going to tell them what life was like and, she was a coder for the Navy. She went to Radcliffe and they had her coding for the Navy of the government during World War I. Wow. And she was having to look for codes in the Japanese, you know, um, things that were coming across. So she's got some amazing stories, yeah. you know. She was born and, after uh, the 1918 pandemic, soon after, actually. Yeah. Right. That's right. And she was born right after the vote. And now that we have a new president and vice president in place and we have a, you know, a woman, it's like, yes. oh, my goodness, like yes. life is coming together. So so um, you, you've met me before. I, I think people say I have lots of energy and I have a lot of energy with Woodward. I think there's a, a really special story here and a special experience for girls and just really want to get the word out for more young women who would be really successful here. Yeah. Well, I mean, something you said when we started our, our conversation um, and it struck me, uh, you said, you know, my parents 
And basically what you mean is the parents of your students. But yes, yes. That, that, says, <laughs> that says to me that you really look at it as, as an extended family. Yeah, yeah. And I have a, a virtual tea with the parent, my parents, every 10 o'clock on Thursday morning. And we just had one this morning. I have done this every Thursday since March. And they, they show up all the time. And we are a more close-knit group than we would be if the pandemic didn't happen. So um, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the pandemic brought good things, but it did allow some opportunities for people to stay more connected through Zoom. So Zoom's an amazing thing, right? And uh, a lot easier, even for you and I, right? I don't have to go down to your office. I don't even have to get dressed up. <laughs> I can just sit here with you from my own office and, uh, and, and do this. And so it's, it's great. So I, I really appreciate the time to be able to share Woodward because I really want the, the Quincy community. But now you can say the whole country because mm -hmm. if you're in North Carolina, you can come to my Zoom mm -hmm. lecture next week, right? And that I really want you know, people to start to know what's happening at Woodward and, and see that we want to be a resource and spread the word that, you know, there, there have to be some young girls because we're an all girls school in, in some schools that just aren't happy and, and not doing well and maybe coming to a smaller environment. I know it's not for everybody, but the small school advantage, you know, helps girls find their voice. And that's what we're all about. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I continue to meet alumni and, the stories I get from them, it's just like, it's still the same place, you know? And it's really, really great. How, I should ask you, how is enrollment uh, going? Uh, I mean, yeah. is, there, is there openings? Yes, there, there are openings. Our enrollment is actually growing uh, daily. We have a junior starting tomorrow, starting on a Friday, but she said, I just want to get a day in <laughs> and then I'll, I'll feel more normal Monday. We have an eighth grader starting uh, in the middle of December. Um, and so we're open, we're, we're working with transfer students right now. And we also have a process on our website for mid-year. For, for, I think there's some students who are interested to finish their first semester remotely at their school and then make the change and make mm -hmm. them, you know, prepare themselves for that. Okay. So we've, we've had a lot of new middle schoolers coming in um, because maybe they were just going into a new school. Uh, in the South Shore, the middle school is the fifth or sixth grade, which is the same as us. Mm -hmm. And so I think they said, why would I start a new school remotely? Let me go to Woodward now. So we're delighted. We're delighted. We're really happy to have the new families. And um, it's all good, all good at, at Woodward, which, you know, even though we're in a pandemic and I can't sound very happy because I, I am em empathetic and sympathetic to everybody and all the hardships a lot of us are, are under, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, even, even if it's the sheer fatigue that we all have, right? <laughs> it's, well, there is a term now, pandemic fatigue. So, yeah. That's right. Exactly. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. How many students in the student body and how many uh, can you have? So we have about 60 to 65 right now because I've got these couple that are in and we can go to uh, the largest enrollment that I know of Woodward in the past 15 years was about 125. Mm -hmm. So that probably is my three-year goal. Okay. Um, and that, you know, we'll always be a small school. That's what we always were. That's what Ebenezer Woodward wanted. A small school that had all the bells and whistles that all the other schools had. And, and that's really translates into programs. And, you know, with our new building, we've got additional science labs. We have a new technology lab. The auditorium is just magnificent. It has a whole new theater stage and we're hoping to, make that available to the public when we can all be normal again. Yes. Um, brand new classrooms. If you walked in here now, the classrooms are as shiny as they were 125 years ago because well. everything's brand new. We haven't been in it. Right. And we, we now have some exciting news that we're in the preliminary planning stages of a gymnasium out back. Um, and we've taken the backyard now, which was kind of a construction site because it was a construction site and we put um, turf down all over and the girls out there every day playing soccer now they're playing catch they're hula hooping and they're they're running track so um so and and that's another part of you know the whole educational process this, yeah. this isn't just about academics because you can almost get your academics on the website now mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. look something mm -hmm. up it's really about the social emotional and the physical development because the physical you know a lot of kids haven't been out doing the exercise that they normally do. And, right. you know, we have um, 
mask breaks regularly between class and we just say, get out of the building, take your mask off, run around, jump, or, jump up and down, get refreshed and come on back in. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we're able to do that, which, which is really great. So we're yeah, really, well, really it's happy a holistic about it. approach. It sounds like, and they're very formative years, you know, for your students. It's what grades, Absolutely. 12, I think. So we're grade six to 12. We are looking at a grade five right now. Okay. So I'm hoping to have a grade five for September. Um, and we're also um, studying the PG year because I think in the next, the postgraduate year, okay. I think in the next two to three years, we're going to find that our 10th and 11th graders maybe don't feel ready for college. Hmm. Um, you know, right now, I don't know what kind of college counseling they're getting. We actually have an information session every Thursday night at 630, which I probably should have told you about that. And tonight it's on college counseling. And we have our college counselor. We have two parents and two teachers and two students. And we have about 12 people coming, but it's open for free. And we advertise it on social media and all um, to come in and talk about our program. And we're getting interest in that. And even if it's not somebody who's going to, you know, it's unlikely for a student to transfer in the 12th grade, mm -hmm. even though we do have one looking at us. Um, the 11th grade is, seems to have some interest now because people are thinking I'll get in for the 11th and 12th. My daughter can get counseled on college. We mm -hmm. can get her on a good track because life, life is a little crazy right now. Right. And unstable. And so we're thinking that we would, we might be offering kind of an extracurricular program called college, uh, college counseling. Mm -hmm. preparation for college because if you're not in if most of these kids are remote now they're not getting that one-on-one -on -one with a college counselor and mm -hmm. you know somebody to hold the hand and say don't worry it's going to be normal again you know because it's a it's a big undertaking to apply to college as a as a junior senior in normal times imagine in pandemic right yeah. right i mean the students wanting to go uh international students who want to go to Florida or the West coast. Nobody knows how to think about that anymore. Yeah. Really right. Lux right now for sure. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's really, really, really sad. Um, but we're, we're trucking away. We haven't stopped. We're not, we're not going to let go. And you know, the holidays are coming, which is great. Um, get a little bit of family time, but other than that, you know, we've been, we've been doing it. So I feel very fortunate and lucky and, and want to spread that and share that with others. So yeah, anything ways, we can do to get the word out. <laughs> yep, one way is your community speaker series and we'll show folks uh, the next one is uh, looks like November 17th. Uh, yes, it's okay. mm -hmm. yeah. How does it actually work, Renee? How do folks join it? Um, they, they RSVP into the website. Oh, okay. And then there's a, a landing page there for just your name and your registration. Okay. And then you will see the, yeah. the link for it. Yeah, actually, I'm noticing this one that you have, and it doesn't say go to the website, does it? No. So we will. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, is, I'll uh, have to go talk looking, about that right yeah, now. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, the woodwardschool.org. You bring it back. It said click here to register, but I guess I don't see that on yours. No, I don't have that on mine. Okay. Okay. Go to the website and they can get yep. it. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Great. Great. Okay. Sure. So you've been doing well? Yes, yeah. we're QATV. well here. Thanks for reaching out. Thanks for using QATV. You know, we appreciate that. Uh, we like to be a sure. community resource um, as well. Right. Okay, great. Well, I've enjoyed our relationship over my two years and let's keep it going. And uh, anytime you want someone to come in and talk about it, you know where I am. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. I appreciate I'll be honest. it. Yeah. Likewise. Okay, thanks, Joe. Reach out to us as well. Great. I will. I will. <laughs> okay, thanks, Joe. I appreciate it. Yeah, bye, bye. Bye. bye.
checking the forecast for you once again for the rest of the day today. Bright but brisk, lots of sunshine, temperatures in the low 50s with a bit of a wind chill. Be a cold night tonight, dropping off into the mid 30s under clear skies. More clouds than sun tomorrow, not even as warm as it was today, only in the upper 40s. Colder still on Wednesday with sunshine mid 30s. Then we start to bounce back up again on Thursday with sun and clouds and temperatures in the low 40s. Thanks again going out to Renee Duchesne Farkas for joining us today. Thanks to our crew. Thank you for watching. And a reminder, please do take part in the Quincy COVID Memories Project. You can share your experiences of life here in Quincy during the pandemic. You can go to quincyculturalmemory.com or you can mail your submissions to the Thomas Crane Library. Attention Local History at 40 Washington Street, Quincy. 02169. Don't forget to please visit our website. Go to QATV.org. You'll find all of our latest programs, news and information, classic and fall sports, video on demand, live streaming, much more. For all of us here at Quincy Access Television, I'm Joe Catalano. Please stay safe.